You're watching Global Trade This Week with Pete Mento and Doug Draper. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Global Trade This Week brought to you by Cap Logistics. I am one of your hosts because this show has two of them. My name is Doug Draper coming to you from snowy Denver, Colorado. On the other side of the country is my good friend and other co-host, Mr. Pete Mento. Pete, I can tell from your backdrop or your background with the um, ornate uh, uh, windows back there, you are in the... Um, uh, Washington D.C. area. Yeah, buddy, nation's capital, the cesspool. Never a more vile. Um, what is it? A vile hive of evil and villainy. I'm here, baby. I'm here. Yeah. Love it. Love it. Very good. Well, we we made a commitment not to talk about weather. I made reference to it literally within ten seconds of our intro, but I'm not going to do that for the rest. That's not going to do, do it. Do you remember when we were younger? We would make fun of people for doing that. We're like, is that all old people talk about? Is like weather and and their and their aches and pains and every day dude every day i catch myself doing it yeah every day mm-hmm. oh. and yeah. like oh my 401k how that's doing honestly someone needs to just put me in a home at this point maybe did, did we ever did we ever figure out the names of those of the two muppets that were in the um in the balcony i don't want a statler i don't remember the other one's name yeah i don't either anyway I sometimes i feel show. like that i love that show when i was a kid I thought it was so funny. Uh, and they always had the best guest. Mark Hamill was on one time. Mm-hmm. I'm going to go down a real geek corridor. You don't stop me, Doug. So we All should right. probably we'll, start with we'll, the show. We'll, we'll shut it off then because yeah. we got a uh, <clears throat> fun halftime. But more importantly, we got some good topics that cover all of the important aspects of the show. Global trade, transportation, logistics, supply chain. Um, and uh, you got a couple of good ones on global trade. So, Mr. Mento, let us, let's get it started. Yeah, buddy. So this week in Philadelphia, a lot of customs compliance and customs professionals will be joining up together for what's called the Strategic Customs and Border Protection Conference. And that conference is put on by CBP. It's a once a year thing. Uh, I will not be there. Other members of our team, the, the person, the people who run operations will certainly be there. I won't. I'm not important enough, Doug. You know, you're important just, to me. You're important to the show, Pete. Thanks, bud. I'm just out there slinging solutions. What can I say? Uh, but this year's agenda is very heavy on e-allegations, man. And for our listeners and viewers who don't know what e-allegations is, CBP has a, uh, a landing page where you can drop a dime on somebody. Where you, as, as an individual, you can say, I know that this importer was doing dirty, or I know this customs house broker isn't doing the right thing, and then give them details, and customs will go after them. So it's a it's like a self serve whistleblower uh, web page. And this week in Philadelphia, it is heavy on e allegations. I think there's there's three different parts that that are solely talking about e allegations. The big reason for that is in 2022, customs house brokers had a pretty radical change to the way that customs looks at us and our responsibility as being part of their enforcement efforts. If we know a customer is doing something wrong, we actually have a responsibility to report it now. That was never the case in my whole career. And if we don't report it, and then someone else reports it, and customs finds out we were working with this company, and we didn't report it, we get in trouble. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, no one likes a rat except for customs and border protection, apparently. And e-allegations is absolutely going to be something they're focusing on. So, um, yeah, you want to talk about a new world, man, a scary new world. Customs is out there trying to get people to to turn on each other in an effort to help them become even more compliant. And one of the main areas is going to be child labor, uh, forced labor. That's going to be something we're looking a lot for, Doug. So, yeah, the government's out there posting rewards for talking smack about your uh, about your neighbors, buddy. Yeah, yeah, I saw that. Whenever you kick that over, I actually went to that site and I started <laughs> filling some things out because I wanted to see what the process was. And uh, wink, I got wink. To... <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, if somebody comes knocking on your door, Pete, it wasn't wasn't me. But uh, uh, five step process. You know, you basically a lot of drop down menus and put in your name, or you can uh, remain anonymous. Uh, I didn't take it all the way to the end. I kind of got bored with it, but. Um, Anyway, it's real. I went out there and, and played around with it. it. So I don't know if it's just the the social media aspect of 
you know, let us um, self-monitor each other and give access to people to, um, to report knowledge. My only concern is that is it going to be um, a revenge site, right? Yeah. I don't want to be too dramatic on that, but somebody wronged you in some form or fashion, or you feel maybe there's something like how can they do these things legally? And um, a lot of um, unscrupulous activity or unfrivolous um, allegations, right? So I, I don't know. That's just me. The first thing that came to mind, I went on there to play around with it. It's pretty easy. A bunch of drop down menus. and then. Are people going to use it for revenge, right? I guess it'd be the two things that popped in my mind. Well, Doug, I, I think that might be where the government's got part of its, its strategy. Mm -hmm. In a world where currently, like our industry, where there's so many layoffs, right? It would be pretty easy for somebody who is pretty upset, right? Disgruntled employee, which is how a lot of investigations start, to go out there and say, oh, you're going to let me uh, walk after so many years of faithful service? How dare you? So. I'm going to drop a dime in all the horrible things I know you've been doing. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, you know, that's not only likely, I think it's probably where most of these things come from, Doug. Yeah. So, mm. I'll be watching that space pretty closely, pal. Yeah. And when's that uh, conference this week? This week. Yeah. I think it starts tomorrow. I'll be in Pennsylvania, but I won't be there. I'll be in Western Pennsylvania on sales calls. So I won't be in Philly. Sorry, everybody. Nice. Very good. Very good. All right. Well, Hey, my first topic, um, is related to the concept that we've heard before, which is called gamification, right? So let's turn everything into a game so you can look on your phone. Probably the lar or the most um, well-known one, in my opinion, would be Robinhood, where they've turned trading into the gamification of things. Um, good or bad, have your own personal opinions on Robinhood. But um, there was this company out there called Lucas Lucasware, which is a software which enables warehouse. So let's focus on the warehouse workforce engagement and um, monitor and, and uh, reward um, productivity in the warehouse through competition. They call it gamification mechanisms, which consist of competition, uh, team competition, sharing performance, which may be a little bit uh, uneasy for some, some incentives, which are financial or others, and then basic recognition. And so, um, yeah, so let's see what we can do to motivate people. If you look, if you take a step back and you look at those three things, Pete, I'm not going to go super deep on this stuff, but humans need connection. We're social animals. We spend a lot of time with people at work. Uh, if you look at the percentages of where we spend our time, uh, work is a significant part. And being in the warehouse can be singular that's maybe the right word or very lonely right i'm that is my world and you go out there and there's a lot of people up and down aisles by themselves picking orders looking down at technology whether it's wearable or whatever it's a very isolated potentially lonely lonely job so having the the workforce develop camaraderie check that makes a healthy employee Sharing performance, that may be a little bit shaky because, you know, sharing your successes and failures is a little bit, um, uh, I can't think of the right word, uh, not challenging. I'll, I'll come back to it in a minute. <clears throat> financial incentives, duh, you and I get financially incentive with our sales efforts and then basic recognition. So I love the idea. Maybe calling it gamification is the new way to, to put uh, new lipstick on the pig, so to speak, but I'm all for it, man. Let's get the warehouse workers together on a team, feeling that there's a purpose, their work matters, and allow them not to be so isolated up and down these aisles picking orders. So anyway, Lucas Software, I don't know much about them, or Lucasware, uh, it caught my attention the other day and I wanted to talk about it. So I don't know, have you heard of this? What's your take on the yeah. term gamification on uh, workforce engagement? Uh, I, I dealt with it a lot. So friend of the show, frequent listener, friend of mine, Adele Chavale, was our CIO at Crane Worldwide. And he and I actually had our own technology company for a while, but he came from the game industry. So before he ever worked for a freight forwarder, the first freight forwarder he ever worked for was Crane. And before that, he designed video games. And the, the idea was, how do we get our customers, mostly, to want to engage with our technology? And it never really occurred to people, you make it fun. You make it something that they can feel they win at. And you start with a scoreboard, right? What are we doing well? What aren't we doing well? Who's winning? 
And then what can I adjust and work with so that I'm winning more? And you turn it into a collaborative gaming effort. And the work that he did was incredible. It's still incredible. The other side of this was I think about how gamification is so common in our life now. You know, um, I'm a big, big lover of Peloton, the Peloton treadmill in particular. And to me, when I'm waddling on my treadmill, it's important to me that I'm not you know, the lower third of people that are waddling at the same time. I want to win. And there's so many things that we see that in now, treadmills, bicycles, rowers. And I think it has to do with the generational attitude, Doug, where many of the people younger than us have been raised in an environment of playing a lot of games. And if you if you look at what they're trying to achieve, achievement is in winning these games. So I think you'll see more and more and more of it. A big reason for that we're trying to get people to engage with our technology so that we don't have to engage with them directly. We like engaging with our customers, but it's cheaper for us to have them engage with technology. So by making it more exciting to engage with technology, we're able to lower our cost to serve. Mm -hmm. I think you see more of it, bud. Yeah, cool. So you uh, have heard of it and you're a fan. Yeah, I'm a big fan. And it's funny because I, I don't allow myself to have a gaming platform, Doug. I don't have an Xbox. I don't have a PS, whatever the hell they are. And the reason for that is very simple. I, I can't trust myself to not blow all my time because I could easily get very submersed in a science fiction kind of environment, you know, playing around with the game. When I was younger, I loved them. But I, I catch myself on certain technologies with certain companies looking at it as a game uh, and seeing how they've done it now that I've been taught, I think, a little more appropriately about how it's used. Yeah. Yeah. I like it. Good. Well, that brings us to um, our halftime, which, of course, is brought to us by Cap Logistics. Please visit them at caplogistics.com. We wouldn't be on our soapboxes without them. And, Pete, I'm looking at the clock. I don't think we've ever gone to halftime in under 12 minutes. So um, I'm excited about this. <laughs> wow. Um, I don't know. Let, I tell you what, let me go first because your topic is good to, to, to end with, right? Um, and mine is related to something I saw this morning. Um, called Boom. Uh, bu 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 it's Boom Supersonic. It's about commercial supersonic travel, right? So my question when I read that is, do we really need it? And is anybody asking for it, right? So if you remember, the Concorde was uh, the last supersonic flight or a uh, uh, plane that we had. I did some research. 1976 was the first um, uh, flight. 2003 was the last flight. And, um, you know, it made a lot of hype. I think if you look at the cost of what a ticket would be in 1976 and 2003, it, you know, I've heard anywhere from $8,000 round trips to $12,000 round trips in, in, um, uh, in, in dollars now. But I started thinking about it. Hey, it's totally cool. The plane looks awesome. The company's called Boom Supersonic. They've already received 130 orders at least commitments of orders from major airlines. Wow. Um, here's the downside. They use a hell of a lot of fuel. The planes are super expensive to build. And there's still regulations in there, Pete, where they're not allowed to have a sonic boom over land, at least here in the United States. So that's going to limit kind of where they can fly. I know it's generally a cross-Atlantic or cross-Pacific um, type, uh, type of plane, but I, I don't know. I don't know if anybody's asking for it. It's kind of cool. Are you going to spend a shitload of money to say you're on this uh, boom supersonic plane? Maybe. I, I, I don't know. But it caught my attention. I wanted to bring it back up. So my question, do you, we were probably too young, but did you know of anybody that um, flew on the, uh, the Concorde or have any fun stories hey. about it? I flew on the Concorde, British Airways. So Seriously? In the late, yeah, in the late 1990s, I was working for a massive accounting firm when all we were doing was spending as much money as possible on dot-com companies. And I got sent to Europe. They paid for the Concorde and I got to fly it. So I did it. One of the most impressive things when you get there is they had their own lounge, right? So that was the first thing. And they gave you a sterling silver luggage tag <laughs> that had Concorde on it with your name. My mother took it from me. So uh, she put it on her luggage forever. Um, you know, I never got that back. Now that I think about it, she passed away. But it was cramped. It was uncomfortable. It was uh, very, it was wonderful being inside of it. The, the food was crazy. 
but there was a speedometer, like a digital speedometer that you could watch how fast you were going. Mm. So it was really cool. Um, in 1998, it was also $13,000. Mm. So um, believe it or not, Doug, that's depending on where you're flying. If you're flying first class, that's actually not that bad. And uh, Joan Collins was on my flight, which was kind of cool. Uh, but I, I got there and on the way back, I did not take the, the, um, the Concorde back. I flew back on British Airways on a 747. I was in the upper deck and it was much slower, but honestly, I felt a lot more comfortable and it's great for the story, but in all honestly, Doug, I mean, I got there really fast and I got through customs really fast, but I don't see what the point is. I, I know that I know that everyone that's listening to this right now is saying, well, I want to get where I want to go as quickly as possible. I get that. There's a reason why the thing isn't flown anymore. It was wrought with all kinds of terrible maintenance issues. I think two of them caught on fire and everybody died in them. You know, I mean, it's it's not, it wasn't a safe aircraft. If we're at a point now where technologically we can do that, I think it's important that we explore it because as, as technology is developed, the cost goes down more and more and more. So do I ever think it's going to be something important for cargo? Like, what do we need that fast other than maybe human organs? I, I can't imagine anything that's got to get moved that quickly. Um, but yeah, it was a singular experience. I, I remember doing it and everyone thinking it was so cool and being incredibly uncomfortable for a flight to London. Yeah. Huh. Interesting. I did not know that about you. That's cool. That's one of those trivia questions when you're sitting around and you get to do an icebreaker and you're like, tell us something that people wouldn't necessarily know about you. Um, so there you go. I've spent the lion's share of my life on airplanes and in Marriott properties. So if it was going to be anybody, it's probably me. Yeah. Sure. Uh, yeah. I, I'm, I'm with you though. I think in 2024, other than the, other than the razzle dazzle pizzazz part of it, you know, I don't really know what the point of it would be, but yeah. people spend a lot of money on crap they don't need in 2024, pal. <laughs> yeah, very true. Speaking of uh, crap you don't need, uh, I think your topic would uh, be able to have us spend a lot of money on a lot of crap that we don't need. So, yeah. what, so what do you got? I'm going to win Mega Millions tomorrow. I'm going to win the 1.1 million. I'm going to take the 500, and, I, think, I think I figured out 565 million after taxes, cash buyout. And uh, first of all, Doug, this show's over. Okay, I need you to understand. I love you, buddy. I love you, Keenan. I love everyone at Cap Logistics. But when I win, we're done. Um, we're going to have some real simple rules. Rule number one, I'm never being woken up ever again. So mm -hmm. I will get up when I get up. I will not own a watch. I will not own a watch. So what time it is, doesn't matter. I will not have an email or a cell phone number. My crack security team, made up of thick necked Russian thugs with like a scar over their eye. Uh, they will have a phone. And if someone needs to get a hold of me, there'll be like two people that have that number. But otherwise, no, no email address. I don't need it. I don't need to have email with anyone ever again. I will never wear trousers ever again. <laughs> I will only wear shorts. And if I have to go someplace where uh, shorts is not appropriate, I'm just not going to go. I'm not going to go. I'm going to have a beautiful compound somewhere in Hawaii and you're welcome to come anytime, Doug, please bring the wife and the kids. You're always welcome. Thank um, you. Yeah, of course. But uh, I am never, I'm going to be the coolest rich guy ever because I'm just not going to do squat. I'm going to read. I'm going to have a, 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 a what do you call them? A trainer and a personal chef. And I'm just going to spend the rest of my life not doing a damn thing. Now I've read a lot about lottery winners, Doug. There's a number of books on the subject. Generally, when someone wins, they're sued by everyone they've ever known. They're sued for the most ridiculous things. They're constantly getting in trouble, and a lot of them just lose all their money. Not going to be a problem for me because I'm going to live in some jurisdiction where you can't extradite me like, I don't know, Malta. And it's going to be magnificent, Doug. It's going to be magnificent. I'm going to spend the rest of my life, the rest, what's left of my life, tan, probably drunk, and, and a little bit drowsy. Uh, for the rest of my life. It's going to be wonderful. Uh, what would you do, Doug, if you won a billion dollars? Wow. I haven't given it <clears throat> that much thought. I mean, the things I love about what you said is no phone, no clock or no watch, uh, no email. And people can get access to me when I say it's okay, not whenever they want to. So I kind of like that. I'd not thought about that simple uh, commitment. So I kind of like that. Um, 
gosh, man, that that's a whole other thing. I'd have to give some serious thought about it. But uh, you've just inspired me to go buy a couple of tickets. What are they? Two bucks? I think so. Yeah. You got a better chance of being struck by lightning four times in a row. Yeah. Than um, than winning, but. Some of the super, I wouldn't buy a lot of stuff, but I would buy myself a 1976 Pontiac Trans Am with T-tops. Yeah. And I would drive specific. in the Bandit. And and Doug, I would throw killer parties. Mm -hmm. I mean, killer parties. I I would have like what's left to run DMC and the Wu-Tang Clan come play at my parties. It would be out of control. I would be the most fun rich person ever. And my company would be called Mento Corp. People would say, what do you do? And I'd say, not a damn thing. (laughs) <laughs> what do you guys make? Good times. That's what we make. How's that sound yeah. to you? Yeah. I love it. Oh yeah, buddy. I'm going to be the most fun, rich guy ever. Yeah. Love it. Yeah. Well, you know what? <clears throat> you miss hundred percent of the, cho- the shots you never take. So you got to go buy a ticket. I will buy a ticket tonight. Yeah. Uh, I, every time I buy a ticket, the math of it sticks in my head because I know better, mm. but it's just fun for a week, you know, for a couple of bucks to think about what I would do. Oh, I would also give a lot of money away. I would give, I would give a shocking amount of that fortune away. A shocking amount. Mm. Away. Yeah. Well, half a billion doesn't go quite as far as it used to. I don't know, man. A six pack of Bud Light's still like seven bucks. So <laughs> uh, I think I'd do okay with that. And I wouldn't be flying the Concorde. I'll tell you that. Um, I'd probably have a bus like John Madden that I went yeah. all over the country with. So I wouldn't even have to fly. It would, oh, God, I would have so much fun. There's no urgency. All right. Cool. Yeah. Well, I tell you what, that's a good way to end the uh, halftime brought to us by Cap Logistics. Um, Now we're going to pivot and get back into some uh, global trade. So, Pete, you're up. Yesterday on 60 Minutes, the president, the the president of Mexico, who's well regarded by his people, gave a um, an interesting interview. I encourage all of you to give it a watch. But some of the things that came up have a lot to do with our our jobs. Doug, one of the big ones is the constant threat by the Trump administration to, quote unquote, close the borders with Mexico. And the president of Mexico said, that's just never going to happen. I mean, he looked right into the camera and said, it's never going to happen. And the reason is American companies depend way too much. And American consumers depend way too much on our agriculture, our manufacturing, and our labor. Just, it's not going to happen. And I I agree with him. uh, But the part that really gets me right now is we are considering hitting Mexico with an additional tariff on steel and on aluminum, mostly extrusions. They had one br- uh, briefly before. And Mexico is saying, if you do that, we're going to hit back. So we're in a new era of Mexico standing up for themselves, of Mexico saying, we're just not going to be some, you know, the little brother who gets beat up when you say, that's my chair, get out of it, right? They're like, no, we're going to stand up for ourselves and we're not going to be pushed around by the United States. We're your largest trading partner. We demand more respect. So, because I'm always trying to look at the future, and so are you, I think that what we're going to see, regardless of the next administration, is a Mexico that's going to push back shockingly hard on the United States in particular for more advantageous trade terms and to really solidify themselves as the number one trading party with the United States for for like a century by Mm. finding ways to make this a more equitable relationship between the two. Mm. What I worry about, though, is, you know, 5% 5% of homicides in Mexico, 5% are prosecuted. That's it, Doug. And no matter how many times a public official in Mexico can say that the drug cartel is not a problem for manufacturing, I talk to American importers, and a number of them still are afraid to do business in Mexico because they're worried about the theft of their product and the things that could happen to the people who work for them there. They still have a long way to go, but in a short amount of time, they have become, without question, America's most important strategic partner. Mm. Well, the one thing that caught my attention on that is the USMCA, which specifically says to promote and protect free trade amongst the three countries that make up North America, right? Like the whole purpose is to allow free free trade. I get it. They're trying to do this stuff, but doesn't that go counter to the whole concept of the USMCA and NATO before that, you know, work on trade agreements that are open so there's more markets and more business can be generated and uh, put together with three countries. So I, I don't kind of get I, where the U.S. would be coming in hardball with with uh, with with new uh, new tariffs against that stuff. It's, I, I don't know. I don't know enough about those level of details. But the first thing I thought is that 
isn't the USMCA to promote and protect free trade between the three countries that make up North America? It is, buddy. Um, but the sad reality of 2024 is that we still have to protect ourselves from certain types of industry. So that's A. And then B, we've always been in a situation where we've kind of dictated to the other two countries what's going to go on. The last the last round when they did USMCA, President Trump basically took anything good from both of those countries out of the of the Canada got particularly lambasted. So now that we're renegotiating it in the coming years, you're going to see Mexico stand up and say, is it really fair? Is it really equitable? Or is this really a free trade agreement for the betterment of the American consumer and the American economy? Mm. Let's make this a little more equitable for all of us. And I applaud Mexico for standing up for themselves. Yeah. Interesting. Well, we'll see how that one plays out. Yes, sir. So, All right, Doug. Bring us home, buddy. All right. So I am about to go against the CEO of a multi-billion dollar company who I say that his prediction is absolutely incorrect and wrong. So um, this is I'm speaking to the CEO of Hopeg Lloyd, a guy named Rolf Jansen. Rolf, is that you? It's like Ralph, right? R-O-L-F, Rolf. Rolf. Rolf, right. So um, he's basically painting this rosy picture that uh, inventories have started to deplete. Volumes are picking up. Uh, Lunar New Year, post-Lunar New Year has seen a spike. And his take is that because of all those factors, peak season is going to come a little bit early this year. Um, and that's what he's, he's predicting. And my take is, no, it's not. It's not going to come early. It's going to come on time or late. And my gut feeling is it's going to be a little bit late. I'm not talking months because peak season's pretty tight, um, but it's going to be late. And the reason I say that, Pete, is a financial piece of it. Even though interest rates are are uh, stable, and Jay Powell's talked about potentially reducing them in the future, it's not till you know there, there's no definitive number or percentage or points or whatever you want to call it. So uh, it still costs a lot of money to borrow, to make products. So you're borrowing against inventory, right? That interest rate is much higher than it has been in the past. So if I'm borrowing money on a high interest rate, I want to sell that crap as fast as I possibly can, right? I don't want it sitting in, in a warehouse. Uh, I don't want it delayed in transit. I need to source it, pay for it, and sell it and condense that window as much as possible. So that is still very relevant in 2024. Here's the other thing, Pete, that we've spoken about is that L.A. is open for business, baby. There's lots of capacity. There's no labor situation anymore. If you're in and around L.A. and you know this as well as I do, there are empty warehouses. There are service providers that are hungry for business. People want to have um, commerce flow through that market. And so there's no barrier once you hit the port. We talked about the connectors and how things can slow down. Those connectors are about as clean and smooth as they've been running for 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 uh, for years and years and years. The money still costs a lot, so I want to get it through the network. I want to get it where it needs to get, and I want to sell it as fast as I as I possibly can. So the shorter that window, the better. And early peak season means that I'm holding on an inventory longer. Mm -hmm. Plus, I think this year people are going to get sick. This is just me personally, and hearing it. I'm tired of hearing stuff for for a sale for the holiday season in early October, right? Let me get through back to school season, like put everything back in their boxes, right? I don't want to talk about buying stuff for the holidays in October, right? So I think the consumer is going to say, I just want to buy it when I want to buy it, which means uh, the, everybody's going to bring it into the U.S. in a very short period of time, and it's going to cost me more money if I'm financing my inventory. So I think just the opposite uh, and if Rolf wants to jump on the show and talk about it or debate it, would love to have him. Anybody knows this gentleman, uh, please extend a, an open invite. But that's my take on Rolf's prediction of an early peak season. I say it's going to be the same or even later this year. So I don't know. That's a lot of info, Pete. What do you think? Well, for, first of all, I, I don't want to disagree with you, right? Like I, I, I'm not going to disagree with you. Uh, I, I, I agree with you, Doug. I think that that's probably wishful thinking. Um, but there's a part of me, Doug, because, you know, we've been dealing with the ocean carriers for so long. Part of me wants to think they'll decide what the hell happens. You know, do they have so much power that they'll decide when peak season's going to happen because of fear of transportation or there's just this voice in the back of my head, buddy. That's like, 
they know something or, mm -hmm. or they're up to something or there's something that they see that we don't see or that they can control that we can't control. I don't disagree with you. I just never put it past ocean carriers to be able to pull something off that, that we're not, you know, paying attention to and focusing on. So uh, all the fundamentals agree with you. So I agree with you. But whenever I hear an ocean carrier make a make a claim like that, I just get a little skeptical. Like, really? What do you guys know that I don't know? Or what's going on that I don't understand? Um, so I have no reason to disagree with you. But again, a little suspect, buddy. A little suspect. Yeah. Yeah. So before we before we get off, there is one thing I want to do, Doug. Yeah. Uh, shout out, friend of the show, Mark Conrad Saxelby. Happy birthday, buddy. Uh, today is his birthday, March the 25th. I believe he's finally hit 85. So, um, you know, big anniversary for him. And, uh, you know, he's a, he's a good friend of both of ours. So I just wanted to make sure I mentioned happy birthday. Tomorrow. That's very nice. And you know what's ironic is my dad's birthday is today, and he literally is turning 85. <laughs> so. Your dad and Mark are the same age? I know. Isn't that crazy? That's nuts. I never my dad went. retired a while back. Saxelby hasn't figured it out yet. I don't think Mark's ever going to really retire because he loves this game too much. But, uh, yeah, happy birthday to Mark. There we go. Happy birthday. All right. All right. So that's going to do it for another uh, edition of Global Trade this week. Thank you, Doug, as always, for keeping me interested and keeping everybody having so much fun. Big shout out to Keenan back at the booth who's eating his homemade dehydrated beef jerky. Probably bison and beef. Excuse me. Mm -hmm. um, again, the most Colorado thing ever said on the show. And thank you, as always, to Cap Logistics for their unending support to us. As a reminder, guys, we don't work for this company, uh, but because they want to keep you, the public, informed, they put this on every single week. Tell your friends, subscribe, and we'll see you again next week for another great edition of Global Trade this week. See you, buddy. Okay. See you, Pete.